Live from Los Angeles, it's theCUBE. Covering Open Source Summit North America 2017. Brought to you by the Linux Foundation and Red Hat. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are live in Los Angeles, California for the Cube special coverage of the Open Source Summit North America with the Linux Foundation. I'm John Furrier, your host, with Stu Miniman, my co-host. Our next guest is Chris Wright, Vice President, Chief Technologist, Office of the, Office of the CTO at Office of Technology at Red Hat. Welcome back, good to see you. Thank you. So this is your world, everything's going down. You got Container Madness, you got the Cloud Native Foundation on hot as could be, everyone's joining. Cloud native looks like it's looking in the middle of the fairway, as they say in golf. <laughs> Everyone loves cloud native. So, what's your take on this open source summit? It's a big tent event. It's kind of a celebration from the roots of Red Hat, really, the success of open source. Well, it's really fun to be here. Partly it's the people, you know, you, you develop relationships over. For me, it's been, uh, I guess, since the late 90s, early 2000 time frame. So that's a long time that I've known some of these people that I'm running into here, and then, balance that with kind of the influx of new folks, which is critical to the longevity of all these projects that we're working on together. Uh, it's a fun event, and I think it's cool to see the, call it rebranding from, was LinuxCon, and then LinuxCon Cloud Open, and LinuxCon ContainerCon, and now Open Source Summit really kind of brings it all together. It's a Big Ten event, it really puts a, 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 a Big Ten around the trend, which is pretty obvious from Jim Zemlin's talk this morning. By 2026, it's literally from 64 million libraries to 400 million open source libraries. The code sandwich now where literally 90% of most IP is going to be open, and 10% right. could be your individual work product, your unique IP yep. that people will be doing, the original idea. So this is a completely beginning of a growth market. Who would have yeah. thought you think we're already <laughs> winning, right? So like, there's more to go. So you guys have been there from the beginning. How do you rationalize that? What's going on in your mind as you look at the future and say, okay, there's a lot of moving parts, still a people, people business, it's still community-based. It's kind of daunting. What's your, what's your reaction to those numbers? Well, I mean, it shows the power of open source, first and foremost. Uh, I think one of the things that's interesting is it's, it's really, easier and easier to get involved in open source and especially creating new projects. And that in and of itself brings on a balance and even a, a tension of it's so easy to create something new, we also have to balance that with focus on what we've already created and evolve. So, you know, if everything is, is greenfield and created fresh, then we're not really leveraging everything that we've built so far, um, but if we're kind of trapped by what we've already built, then we can't do that fresh innovation. Yeah. And I think that's an interesting tension for the industry. And the new developers that are coming on board, they're being attracted by the, the legends and the open source, you guys and you in particular, other luminaries. But these guys don't have a lot of the institutional, I won't say baggage, but knowledge. <laughs> like, hey, I just want to write apps. Infrastructure, they gravitate towards containers, they gravitate towards Kubernetes. So, of course, the, the new blood coming in yeah. loves the container stuff, loves the Kubernetes. So that's a big factor in the popularity, and one of the factors. Huge, developer ease of use is, is a, you know, and the ability to move quickly is a big driving force behind that container space. And it, I kind of look at it as a spectrum of, back in the day, we had our special handcrafted artisan servers where you're supplying the entire operating system, you're keeping it up to date with patches, you're including your application plus its runtime and runtime dependencies all together. Uh, you can just lift that and put it in a virtual machine, then you can kind of move forward into a more cloud-based virtual machine where you get some stateless behavior. Uh, and as you're moving along, the developer's responsible for a little less of that underlying infrastructure. Yeah. You get to a container and you're starting to focus more on the application its direct uh, runtime and, and application mm -hmm. dependencies. Focus being, for the developer, writing code, and for their you know, company that they're working for, creating value. A new artisan role, which is create a great product. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you could even roll that all the way forward to say serverless fits in that spectrum, and there you're just focused on your business logic and you know, letting the underlying platform really uh, take the rest of the responsibility away from you as a developer. So on the one hand, we have DevOps bringing things together. On the other hand, we, we're really enabling specialization so operations teams can build platforms, developers can write applications. 
Yeah, I interesting, it's that interesting dichotomy. We talked about everything collapsing down. You know, Red Hat has a software-defined version of every piece of infrastructure, yet really what you're doing is building distributed systems where everything is disaggregated. How, how, how do you uh, really, as, as you build this technology, Balance that, where, where, where does Red Hat put its focus? How do you fit in with the, what the foundation's doing? Well, initially we're customer driven, so we're looking at what are the key requirements from our customers. Um, in that space, I love that you brought up distributed systems because m from my perspective, distributed systems are non-trivial. It's, it's a challenging space to work in. One of the things that we're trying to do is make distributed systems accessible to you know, the, the broad, enterprise developer population. So one of the things you see in a platform like a container orchestration platform like Kubernetes is the ability to schedule your workloads around a cluster so you don't have to do the cluster management. The next generation we'll see bringing, as you kind of decompose your application to more and more services, the network becomes a core central part of your application. So recombining your application to the network is a critical part of your application. And bringing that network topology, network definition down into the platform so that it's not a key consideration of the application developers, you know, again, making those distributed systems accessible yeah. to the app. Chris, app I want you to take us inside the Open Container Initiative, OCI, the 1.0 release is done. Red Hat's been working on containers about a decade now. Um, yeah. Some people look at it and be like, wait, it's just a container format. Is this a pretty granular level? Why is this important to be able to building the systems that you've been talking about? Well, we're, we're working in major industry trends at this point, and containers are a huge part of the industry, and having some standardization so that we know that images are functional uh, that from a format perspective with runtimes supporting a specification for the runtime and, and the image format, independent of the orchestration platform, really helps build that ubiquity that we're going for with, with containerization and containerized application workloads so that we can be confident when you're building developing your container image that you know it will run in a standards compliant environment. So I think it's really important. It's also interesting. We've done a lot of work in open source to create what I would call de facto standardization where everybody uses the same platform or tool like Linux. Uh, and now we're looking at how do you create some sort of formalized standardization without going into full-blown standards bodies and kind of killing the momentum of open source development. Yeah, uh, you mentioned serverless, so I have to ask you your opinion on that, because today there's a lot of different options for serverless. There's a couple of open source versions, but predominant yeah. one, you look at AWS Lambda, you know, not open source, uh, you know, I can use you know, Azure functions. Where do you think you know, we need to go with, with, with serverless, and how does the work that you're doing in containers lead into that? Well, container, environment is a great environment to host the runtime that's supporting the serverless environment. So right. serverless, obviously, mis misnomer because there's a server involved, right. it's just that you're not managing it as the application developer. Uh, so it makes a lot of sense to launch a container with the core runtime and, and load the application uh, content into that runtime as, as part of a serverless environment. Creating some portability across different cloud platforms I think will be really important for a whole class of, I know, our customers. And so using something like AWS Lambda uh, is going to really tie you into the AWS infrastructure. So you know, if that works for you, great. If not, you need to look outside to an open source platform that can run independently of the underlying infrastructure. So for us, we've been spending a lot of time doing work in the OpenWISC community, uh, trying to bridge that into uh, Kubernetes, so there's a good relationship. So you got container orchestration to launch the serverless environment managed by OpenWhisk. And then the next question is how do you get events triggered out of whatever, whether it's your own application stack or the external uh, cloud that you're running on, events triggered to run the functions that you're writing uh, in this functionless, uh, function as a service environment. Where's Red Hat heading with all this? If I'm going to boil it down, talk to a CXO, and someone says, hey, I just ran into Chris on theCUBE, and what did he say? Well, boil it down for the CXO. What's that message to the C-suite? Because you know, they, they hear Kubernetes this, Pivotal Container Service that, VMware's got, it's like, okay, boil it down to me. I got Red Hat, I got RHEL, 15 years before, I've been using Red, Tier 1, open source, I, but I want to go to this serverless direction. I want DevOps. What does all this mean? How do you bottom line it for the CXO? Probably a couple core tenants, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, one, 
On the operations side, we're really trying to move towards simplifying operations so that operations runs more uh, policy defined. On the developer side, we're trying to simplify the developer's life so that what you're developing is directly translating to business value. You know, you're really trying to build something for your company. To do that, we're building standardized platform. Kubernetes being a primary example, that platform of Kubernetes is actually orchestrating applications that are Linux applications running in a Linux environment. And uh, from a Red Hat point of view, we've been invested in Linux for quite some time, so we're really confident in our ability to build up that application stack that was an application sitting on a single instance of Linux, now distributed across a data center, you know, managed with yeah. Kubernetes as the standard kind of platform, but still looking at Linux as the real host for the actual application and the application runtime. So you say basically, to paraphrase, I'm the sales guy or I'm the consultant or architect. Look, we've been doing Linux for decades. We're your guys for Kubernetes. We have a standard, we're going to make sure it works for you. That's right. I mean, what if that's, I mean, that's containers? The containers I mean, are Linux. I mean, no one wants to have orchestration of stuff that needs to be managed. Right? I mean, it's got to work. That's right. You got to be debugged. Yep. Developers wow. are going to break stuff, <laughs> right? I mean. And, and that, that's a whole, a really important part of just the distributed system world is insight into what's happening in the application. So if you... It's a black box, that's, that's like, it, it, no one's going to buy into that. tap into that. So this, is, this is one thing I said that. earlier, I want to get your thoughts on this. Is then, is the Kubernetes container business then the better mousetrap will win? Because that seems to be what I keep hearing. It's like, yeah, I got this, but at the end of the day, ops guys just don't want stuff to break. That's right. So it's like, the, it better work. The right. better product, in this case, will win. Right, and, and I think it's... You agree. What's, what's supportable uh, from, from the ops team, so they're looking at deploying something that needs to be manageable, so there's simplicity of uh, the management there. Also, who's going to stand behind that? So if, if you're working in an environment where you have a vendor, obviously, we, we think that, that support and services are a really important part of keeping that up and, and running in mission critical environments. That ops team is trying to keep a platform stable to run applications. Mm -hmm. The app team is really trying to build those applications as quickly and move them as quickly as possible to you know, address market requirements or, or you know, opportunities or threats. And that's, you know, that's where we're going. Yeah. So, so Chris, want to circle back to OCI. 1.0 is out. Yes. How's Red Hat feel about kind of what's in there and what's still to come? Well, it's a great starting point. So we've got core image format and, and runtime sort of specified. Uh, we had some initial code associated with those specifications as part of the OCI project, and also expectations that as we solidified that specification, we get further adoption from other parts of the ecosystem, and we're seeing the evidence of that happening today. So it's a great milestone. It's definitely the beginning. Uh, you know, you see in Kubernetes different ways to manage uh, container images that are OCI compliant. It's re you know, really important. We're excited about the Cryo project that we're working on within Kubernetes, which is bringing OCI compliant to the container uh, uh, runtime in, in Kubernetes. So, great first step. You were going to see the next steps of caring about uh, the distribution, the kind of signing and verification of signatures, really making this a robust system but we had to get started and it, it took a while to get here yeah. and we're, we're pretty excited, even though I, I know we wish we got there sooner, but <laughs> it takes time yeah. to get everybody on the same Well, page. Chris, it's great to see you again. I really feel like I'm just bummed out that you, I couldn't make the Red Hat Summit this year. Stu handled it before I was in Boston, I was in California. It's great, um, You guys are doing great. Great to see the continued success of Red Hat. Again, another generation of growth coming down. Congratulations. Thank you. Hi, right, Chris Wright, the VP and Chief Technologist at Red Hat. Inside the Cube here for day one of Open Source Summit, the new event, that the big tent event for the open source community, powered by the Linux Foundation's The Cube's exclusive coverage. I'm John Furrier, Stu Miniman. Back with more live coverage after this short break.